Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from a civil service examinations perspective. So today we are going to discuss the Hindu Daily edition dated 15th March 2023. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on the screen and the time stamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now let us begin our today's session. Now let us begin with our first topic. This topic has appeared at the text and the context page and this topic is in relation to the landfills catching fires during summers. The immediate context of this very topic is that recently the landfill near a site Brahmapuram has caught the fire. However, this phenomena is very frequent during the summer seasons across the country. So that is why today we are taking this particular topic. Now despite the fact that this article which has appeared in today's The Hindu Daily Edition is restricted to the sense of landfills catching the fire but for today's DNS we will be taking up the overall topic that what are the various issues associated with the waste generation in India, what can be the strategy to deal with those challenges. Also we will discuss that why is it so that landfills frequently catch fires during the summers. So in this very line today we will begin our session. First, with the help of this flow chart, we will analyze the scale of the present situation and associated issues in the overall waste generation in India. Now, first of all, as far as the scale of waste generation is concerned, just talking about the urban areas, the data suggests that in urban areas in 2014, the overall waste which was recorded was around 62 million tons. And by 2030, this is expected to rise to 165 million tons. Now remind you that this data is just from the urban India because in the rural areas we do not have the adequate mechanisms to monitor the data regarding waste generation. Yes, also the cities generate larger waste compared to the rural areas because of the higher density of population as well as the lifestyle. So first of all, by 2030, 165 million tons of waste will be generated only by the urban India. And this amount is very huge. So the first challenge or the issue which comes in the waste generation of India is the quantity of this waste which is generated. As far as the global levels are concerned, out of all the total waste generated across the cities for which data are available, 12% of the total waste is generated by Indian cities. Now compared to the share of population which is around 17%, this share is less but again we must understand the fact that even in India also, even if we are talking only about the cities, the data for the waste collection is not very effectively managed. So that is why the data which is reported 12% is far lesser than the actual data or the actual waste which is generated by Indian cities. So first is the huge amount of the waste generated. The second issue related to the waste management in India is the processing efficiency. Now data suggests that around 95% of the total waste which is generated by cities is collected in those cities. But out of this total waste, the processing of the waste which takes place is just around 30 to 40 percent. So let's say that if 100 units or 100 kg of waste is generated by the cities, 95 kg of waste is collected which is actually a very good number. But out of this 95 kg, just 30 to 40 kg which means that less than 50 percent of this waste is processed and that is why we are not able to recycle this waste. The third major issue related to waste management is the heterogeneous composition of the waste. Despite various policies being implemented on ground focusing towards segregation of the waste, still the reality is that we are not segregating the waste. And out of the total landfills, now what exactly are the landfills? Landfills are basically the disposal of the waste material by either burying it especially as a method of filling in and reclaiming the excavated pits. So almost all the mega cities like Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, in all the mega cities tier 1 towns, you might have come across a huge heaps of mountains being formed out of the waste collected over there in those landfills. 
So if you closely analyze those landfills, you will find that there is a very heterogeneous mixture of various forms of wastes. For example, around 60% of the total waste in those landfills is of biodegradable nature, 25% is of non-biodegradable nature, and 15% is of inert nature. For example, stones and silt types of wastes. Now to manage those wastes, to recycle those wastes, different forms of mechanism and different technologies are required for each of these categories. We cannot have one size fits all approach to deal with each type of waste. But when there is one unit having all the types of waste clubbed together, then it becomes very difficult to manage these wastes. So this is also one of the larger issues. Now next, the fourth major issue is the open waste disposal. For example, we have talked about landfills or the heaps of mountains which are formed. Now this open waste disposal has created the challenge of waste fires. And that is why, as the news article suggests, that landfills catch fires during the summers. Now why does this phenomenon take place? Because out of the total waste which is present over the landfills, there are several flammable materials also in that waste because we have discussed that the wastes are heterogeneous in composition. So during the summers, the decomposition activities of the bacteria or microorganisms increase. When there is increase in decomposition during summers, there is a rise in the local temperature of that particular landfill or that particular region. Also, the overall temperature in the summer months are also increasing. So that is why due to the rise of temperature, these flammable materials catch fire. And once they catch fire, the scale of the problem rises tremendously because it becomes very difficult to control the fire over the landfills. The next major issue in this relation is the low utilization of the technology to manage these wastes. For example, we are not using the technology for the segregation of waste or for record keeping or for monitoring. Now the question arises that how can we leverage the technology or let's say the potential of digitization in managing the waste. We will see with the help of a very good example when we will be discussing the strategy to manage the waste in the next section. But as of now is concerned, the low technological utilization is also one of the major challenge behind waste management in India. And the last but not the least challenge is the law enforcement agencies. There are several laws, there are several orders which are being given by the NGT as well as Supreme Court but they are not implemented on ground. For example, NGT has ordered that there should be a restricted limit on the heights of these landfills. But do you think that it is implementing on ground? No. Similarly, NGT has also ordered for the mandatory biostabilization methods in order to treat these waste generated. But again, we are not implementing such orders on ground. So because of all these factors, the waste management in India is taking a toll and hence leading to various issues. For example, air pollution, groundwater contamination, river pollution, etc. So now if all these are challenges, then obviously you must know that what can be a way ahead to tackle all these issues. So now we will be discussing four major steps which can be taken in this regard. First is the technological integration. For example, the policies must be formed in order to leverage the potential of various new forms of technology. For example, RFID which stands for Radio Frequency Identification. Similarly, GPS, machine to machine communication, web based applications, all these can be integrated in order to manage the waste. But now the question arises that how these modern technologies can help us to manage the waste. The answer to this is the smart bin project in Jabalpur. So this project is around four to five years old. It was started in the city of Jabalpur as a pilot project. But this is a very good example or you can use this as a case study to prove the point or to substantiate your argument that how the technology can be used in order to manage the waste in India. 
So we will see that what exactly is this smart bin project in Jabalpur. So Jabalpur is one of the cities located in the state of Madhya Pradesh whereby the central government started the using RFID technology that is radio frequency identification in order to manage the waste which was generated in the city. Now how does this technology and this whole ecosystem works we will look with the help of this video. So these are the RFID tags which are posted or which are located on the outside of the walls of the houses. There is a command and control center which acts as a central authority to manage or to monitor this overall ecosystem whereby the workforce is employed and is getting the real-time information about the waste management in the residential units across the cities. They have the real-time data regarding the various components which are there for the waste management. So here all the blue dots which you are seeing are the residential units that is the houses of the citizens of that particular city. So the waste collection vehicles reaches the houses of the citizens. They collect the waste, they put that waste into their vehicle and after that they go to the RFID tags which are located outside the walls. They scan that RFID and this data is transmitted to the central command coordination center and these officers are able to visualize these things. Now as soon as this data is transmitted from let's say one residential unit, the blue color of that residential unit gets changed into the green color. So now all these green colors will help the officers at that particular center to know that the waste has been collected from these units. So this helps in the real-time monitoring and tracking of the waste collection. And at the same point of time, the citizens also receive the messages on their phone that their waste has been collected. Now there might be some situations whereby the waste collection machines have not arrived. If that is the case, then the provisions have been made whereby citizens can directly contact the coordination center and soon within few minutes the vehicle will reach to their houses and they will collect the vehicles. And also under this smart bin project, these dustbins have also been established across the cities. These dustbins are also integrated with the technology. How? Let us see this. These dustbins have sensors in them. So as soon as the dustbins reach their 80 to 90 percent of the capacity, the officers in the central coordination center receive the message. Then this message is transmitted to the waste collectors and then they go with the real-time location of those dustbins and they collect the waste. This is done in order to maintain that these dustbins do not run out of their full capacity. All the waste which is collected through these dustbins or the residential units are then transferred to waste to energy plants and that is how the energy is also being generated out of the waste of these residential units. So this is the perfect example whereby you can prove the fact that how technology integration can help you to manage the waste. Now we will move towards the second suggestion that is the landfill capping. Now what is landfill capping? It is basically placing a cover over a contaminated material. Let us see that how this process works. So this is a diagram to understand that what is basically a landfill cap. Now the waste is buried into the land. Above this layer of the waste there is a soil barrier layer so that this waste does not come out. But these waste release huge amount of gases also which needs to come out otherwise there can be fire in the waste. So that is why this gas outlets is to be provided and this is basically the gas vent layer. These gases will be released outwards with the help of a pipe and will be collected. Above this gas vent layer there is a drainage layer also because now the question is that why is there a drainage layer again because during the rainy seasons when the water will percolate under the ground surface it will get mixed with this waste. When it gets mixed with this waste there can be chances of leakages of contaminated water from these areas to the nearby areas and that is why we need to have the drainage layer also. 
above this drainage layer we have a barrier protection material and at the topmost surface we can use this surface for various activities for example we can make a playing ground over that area we can construct some buildings over that area but there is a challenge in this landfill capping process one is high initial cost this landfill capping process is very costly and second is this scientific or the highly specialized or technical nature of this landfill capping and in relation to this third is the possibility of the leakages because if this capping or these layers are not properly built if the proper scientific process is not followed then there are high chances that there will be the leakage of the contaminants from these wastes which can lead to disasters so that is why landfill capping is not one of the most desired solutions as far as the india is concerned and therefore the second method must be followed which is basically the bio remediation technique bio remediation is basically a process of detoxifying or degrading the contaminants present in the soil waste water or industrial sludge by biological means so that is why because we are using the biological means this process is relatively cheaper as well as greener the third step which must be follow is that the waste management policies programs and schemes must be properly designed they must have the principles of monitoring as well as accountability attached again the technological measures must be inculcated in all these waste management policies and community participation must form the core component of all these policies in relation to this we have the last point also we that the government or the local administration must run the regular waste management campaigns in order to sensitize the population so that the basic segregation of the waste can take place at the residential unit level itself so these are the certain way ahead or the strategies which we can include and implement in order to deal with all these challenges which are in relation to the waste generation or waste management in india so this was a pretty lengthy topic we shall revise this topic in brief once again the topic has appeared in today's the hindu daily edition at text and the context page in the context of the landfills catching fires during the summer seasons in this regard we have discussed as a first part the challenges or the issues related to the waste management or generation in india these challenges are in the terms of huge quantity or the amount of the waste which is generated very low processing efficiency complex as well as heterogeneous mixture of these wastes which do not allow us to recycle these wastes then the practice of open waste disposal which leads to landfill fires further low technological utilization for segregation record keeping as well as monitoring and poor enforcement of the law as well as orders of various green bodies in last we have discussed that what can be a way ahead in terms of technological integration landfill capping bio remediation waste management policies as well as waste management campaigns here we have discussed a very important case study related to the smart bin project in the city of jabalpur in madhya pradesh now we will move towards our second topic this topic is also similar in theme as we have discussed the previous topic that is the waste management however this topic is mainly related to the manual scavenging now manual scavenging is also one of the most pressing concerns when it comes to the overall situation of the waste management in our country the immediate context of this very article which has appeared in today's the hindu daily edition at page number 12 is that ministry of social justice has said that since 1993 around 1035 people have died while undertaking hazardous cleaning of sewers now this is a very detrimental situation for the country as developed as india is concerned now if you have to understand the topic of manual scavenging as such the issues related to it 
then you must go to the DNS dated 5th March 2023, which was taken up by Ankit Kolsar. So that is why we are not discussing manual scavenging as a complete topic today. But we are discussing two important components associated with this manual scavenging. One is the Namaste scheme, which is launched by the central government. So this topic today we are going to deal mainly from the prelims perspective. Such schemes are very important. We deal with the important issues in our country and more so when they are the central sector schemes that is launched by the center as well as funded by the center. So let us look at certain key facts related to this particular scheme. Namaste is an acronym which stands for National Action for Mechanized Sanitation Ecosystem. It is basically a central sector scheme of Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. Now this scheme has been implemented by this ministry in collaboration with Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. So basically it is a joint initiative of both these ministries. It envisages basically the safety and dignity of sanitation workers in urban India. It aims to provide sustainable alternate livelihood, enhancing their occupational safety, thus providing them with the machines as well as the protective gears. As well as this scheme also focuses on the capacity building of those workers. The important target area of this particular scheme is 500 cities. That means that Namaste scheme is converging with the Amrut program. Further, there is also a provision of insurance for these workers as well as their family. So that is why Namaste aims to provide the safety net to the identified workers and their families under Aishman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana. This key fact is very important because in prelims, a direct statement can be asked in relation to the Namaste as well as the component of Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana. And the funding pattern of this particular insurance scheme within this Namaste program is that the premium for this scheme for those identified worker families who are not covered earlier shall be born under the Namaste program itself. Another important fact related to this particular scheme is whereby UPSC can play when it will provide you certain options if they ask the question on Namaste. We have discussed that Namaste aims to provide this sustainable alternate livelihood for the workers. Now what does this livelihood mean? It means that if the workers who are involved in manual scavenging and they are planning to start their own enterprises. Then also Namaste will help those individuals to start their own enterprises. But this help is not free. So this thing is to be kept in mind. That is why it is written that in case the worker decides to adopt an alternate livelihood of their choice, skilling support will be provided to these workers and the rate of interest will be chargeable on the self-employment projects, including the sanitation related projects. So that means this is not free. Rate of interest will be charged on the funds or the loans which is provided to those workers. But yes, the support will be in the form of financial also, that is loan as well as in skilling those workers also. So this program is important as far as this year prelims examination is concerned. In line with this, we will move towards a new technology which was there mentioned in PIB in relation to the waste management. The name of this technology is the Shesha technology. Again, a small topic, factual topic, mainly relevant for the prelims exam. Now this diagram shows you basically the Shesha technology. It is in relation to the waste management. It is a compact helical shaped waste converter aims to manage the biodegradable waste. Again, important. The Shesha technology is for the biodegradable waste, which is generated in small housing societies, restaurants, etc. This technology basically is an in situ process and it can be installed at certain smaller locations. And that is why it has a decentralized nature to process the biodegradable waste. 
Further, this whole system has also the potential to generate good quality fuel as well as manure required for the soil applications. The name of this particular technology is derived on the basis of the serpentine shape of the digester, its resemblance to the snake and also it reflects the Sanskrit name because in Sanskrit we write shesh which means as waste. So this was a very small topic that is shesha technology as well as the namaste program in relation to the waste management. So now moving towards our next topic. This topic has appeared at page number 6 in the article section. The topic reads a case for a better electricity public hearing. The immediate context of this very topic is that the author in this article says that in the backdrop of COVID-19 when the whole world was facing the restrictions on the mobility, the processes of public hearing and public discussion in the overall power or electricity ecosystem in our country was also discontinued. However, presently the system is renewing and in online and offline modes both the public consultation is underway. So this is the very context of this news article. As we all know that decisions on the planning and the operations of the power sector has a significant impact on the public and that is why it is important to have the public discourse and public discussions during the planning phase of this overall power policies. However, this is not the only issue when it comes to the power sector of India. So that is why in today's session, we will discuss all the important issues related to the power sector in India, potential of power and electricity, present status, issues as well as road ahead. So we will discuss all the dimensions one by one. First of all, we should know that what is the present status of power in India. According to data in 2022, the peak demand of the power reached 210.79 gigawatts. As far as the contribution of the renewable sources in this power sector or the installed capacity in this power sector is concerned, the solar energy has the greatest share in the total installed capacity with 61.62 gigawatts. Wind has around 41.84 gigawatts, biomass has around 10.7 gigawatts and hydropower that is if we combine large as well as small hydropower projects it is around 51 gigawatts and the remaining is coming from the fossil based power sources. So this is the present status regarding the installed capacity as well as the peak power demand. Moreover, several data have suggested that in the coming future, in the backdrop of very high population and the potential of economic growth, the power demand is expected to rise multifold. So that is why also it becomes imperative for our country, for our policy makers to draw a rational policy for the power set in order to meet these rising demands. Now we shall discuss that what is the potential of this power sector ecosystem in India. First of all, we should note that India is the third largest consumer as well as producer of the electricity in the world. In the coming years, the expected consumption is to rise about 2000 TWH. Further, in recent years, government has also come up with a dedicated schemes and policies in terms of 100% foreign direct investment, Deen Dayal Upadhyay Grameen Jyoti Yojana, Saubhagya scheme, as well as granting the infrastructure status to the energy storage systems under the budget 23 to 24. This dedicated policy support by the government further increases the potential of this power sector in our country. And this has been reflected in increasing investments in this sector. For example, $16.39 billion of FDI has entered in our power sector. The National Infrastructure Pipeline 2019-25 to says that out of 111 lakh crore allocation which is to be made for the overall infrastructure rejuvenation in our country, most share that is 24% of the share 
is going to the power sector. So this is basically the potential of power sector in our country which will further attract the investors both domestic as well as foreign in this ecosystem. However, besides these merits, there are certain issues and challenges also in our power sector. And the first and the foremost issue is related to the fuel supply. As we all know that majority of our power is dependent on the fossil based fuel resources and most importantly being coal. So coal has to be transported to a very large distances which increases the cost of transportation. Further, high logistics cost in the absence of multimodal logistics connectivity also derails the timely availability of coal to various power plants. There are cases of thefts also. And moreover, contractual enforcement related to the mining processes or the leases etc. are also not very efficient in our country. And these are certain factors which in turn eventually discourages the investors to invest in the power sector. And not only the investors, the end consumers are the ones who bear the largest brunt. The second important issue is the situation of the power distribution companies or known as DISCOMs in our country. Their collection efficiency is very low. Metered connections are also not available. Technical losses are also very high. Some of the estimates suggest even that when there are no subsidies or if we remove all the subsidies, then these technical losses will further go up by 50%. The third issue is the lack of coordination among various departments. For example, Agriculture, Housing and Urban Affairs Ministry, Power Ministry, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, etc. And the fourth issue is related to the very high transmission and distribution losses. Data suggests that in India, these TND losses accounts for around 22.3%. And when we compare this with the developed world, in developed countries, it is hovering around 6 to 11%. So India is facing the transmission and distribution losses more than two to three times vis-a-vis -vis the developed countries. So these are certain issues. Yes, we agree that government has come up with the dedicated policy support, but still these issues exist. After this, now we shall look that what is the road ahead? What are the various targets which government of India has set for itself? The first is that the government of India is preparing a rent a roof policy for supporting its target of generating 40 gigawatts of power through solar rooftop projects. Further, the Central Electricity Authority estimates that India's power requirements to grow to reach 817 gigawatts by 2030. Also, by 2029 to 30, it estimates that the share of renewable energy generation would increase from 18% to 44%, while that of thermal energy will reduce from present 78% to 50%. In order to make the power sector more green, the government has also planned to establish a renewable energy capacity of 500 gigawatts by 2030. So, the time will tell that how far are we able to complete these targets given the existing issues and challenges. So this was whole regarding the power sector of India. Now moving towards our last topic. This topic has appeared at page number 12. The topic reads, the house panel on tribal affairs apprehensive about PM PVTG outlay without the population data. So the context of this very news article is that government has recently announced 15,000 crore expenditure outlay for Pradhan Mantri particularly vulnerable tribal group development mission. So PM PVTG is an acronym for Prime Minister particularly vulnerable tribal group. And the standing committee has expressed a disappointment that such a huge sum of expenditure for a particular scheme and that too without the population data is apprehensive. So 
so that is why today we are dealing with this topic this topic is mainly from the prelims examination perspective so that is why we will look at certain key facts which are important as far as this news article is concerned now first of all understand this very term particularly vulnerable tribal groups now we know that the tribal groups face several challenges in terms of literacy access to resources access to basic healthcare services infrastructure development employment job opportunities etc but the most important problem which the tribal communities face is gradual loss of culture so the challenges for tribal groups as well as the particularly vulnerable tribal groups are almost similar but they differ in the intensity so that is why in 1973 on the basis of dhebar commission a separate category was formed which was known as primitive tribal groups ptgs which was later in 2006 was renamed by the central government as pvtg particularly vulnerable tribal groups on the basis of dhebar commission the criteria for identification of the pvtgs was fourfold first pre agricultural level of technology that means the tribal groups which are based or which are sustaining their lives on the pre agricultural level of technologies they will be classified as pvtgs second low level of literacy third economic backwardness and fourth is also very important declining or stagnant population because you yourself imagine that across the india's length and breadth there are various tribal groups for example in rajasthan we have meenas similarly in andaman nicobar we have sentinelies so can you compare both these tribal groups in terms of their socio economic development obviously the meena tribal group will be more dominant compared to sentinelies they are in the indian's mainland they have access to certain they have access to roads they have access to basic healthcare services but on the other hand the tribal groups in andaman and nicobar islands they do not have access they are not even linked to the modern world so that is why we need to differentiate even among the tribal groups so as to make rational policies so in this regard the government came up with the pm pvtg development mission basically it is the mission which aims at the overall development of particularly vulnerable tribal groups it aims at basic facilities such as safe housing clean drinking water and sanitation improved access to education health nutrition road and telecom connectivity as well as sustainable livelihood opportunities this particular mission was launched as a part of reaching the last mile leaving no citizen behind as there are 75 pvtg groups spread across 18 states as well as union territories of andaman and nicobar islands out of all these 75 pvtgs the maximum number of pvtgs are in the state of odisha so these are the certain basic key facts relevant from the prelims perspective so that is all for today all the very best and study hard